CGS Book Club. Thank you. Uh, CGS Book Club, uh, for which we are joined uh, for one more time uh, by our friends from WFM Canada. I'm today's moderator, James May. I'm a CGS Program Officer. Um, thank you for joining us today for a special session uh, about Mondial. Uh, Mondial, which is published semi-annually, invites thought leaders to provide insight into the most pressing global challenges. The journal primarily focuses on World Federation, disarmament and peace, human rights, United Nations reform, strengthening international, international institutions, and world law, and the environment. Drawing its name from the French word meaning of or involving the whole world, Mondial, Mondial serves as a journal uh, with a shared common vision of advocating for a democratic World Federation. Uh, we are joined by some of the authors from the winter edition of both Canadian and US editions today. I will give a brief introduction to each author prior to their presentation, and then they'll have the opportunity to uh, highlight their articles. Um, we'll open up for Q&A about 12.50, maybe a little bit later um, due to our late start. Uh, before uh, introducing our authors, I have a little housekeeping to run through. So Drea is monitoring the chat. Um, so if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to her or post uh, questions directly in the chat for the authors. We're recording today's session. It will be available on CGS's YouTube channel by uh, mid next week. To ensure there is enough time for everyone to ask questions towards the end of the session, I'm going to set a community agreement and ask you all to keep your questions or comments to just two minutes. Um, while being respective or, uh, respectful of our authors and their time. Um, if you go over the, your time, I will interject and ask you to sum up. Um, does anybody have any objections to our community agreement? Nobody pops up? Okay. So unfortunately, uh, the first news I have is that Saba uh, Qureshi, who wrote the article Kashmir's Fight for the Self-Determination uh, and Azadi Continues, um, will not not be able to join us together at short notice something has come up um she sent uh, an email um shortly uh, before um offering her apologies and um and thanks to everybody for their interest in the article um and that means we will start today um with uh dan perel um dan is the author of the the article un reform three paths forward um dan is a representative of the united nations to the United Nations, I apologize, um, of the Baha'i international community. His areas of work include social development, climate change, and global governance. He's currently co-chair of the coalition for the UN We Need and is formerly, uh, sorry, and was formerly um, a global organizing partner of the NGO Major Group and chair of the NGO Committee for the Social Development. 2010, Dan received a JD from the University of Virginia Law School, then an MA in Law and Diplomacy from the Fletcher School at Tufts University. Dan is the co-author of the article UN Reform, Three Paths Forward. Um, a link to this article will be in the chat. Dan, would you like to take us away? Um, perhaps give us about 10 minutes insight into your article, then we'll move on to the next author. And at the end, we'll come back for questions and discussion. Take it away, Dan, thanks very much. Thank you so much, uh, James and, and everyone. Um, and my apologies for the bio. I really, we have to figure out a way to do bios that d doesn't read like, the way mine reads. Uh, so anybody who wants to fix mine, please, please do. Um, <clears throat> so yes, this article, I thought that maybe I would um, offer a couple of thoughts about why we wrote it, um, and then why the content is the way it is, and then maybe what hopes we have for it. Um, and then maybe that will last a full 10 minutes. Um, and if not, I can offer a few jokes. Uh, so why did we write it? Uh, so at the at the General Assembly last year, um, the, the high level week, which occurs in the third week of September in New York, um, there was a meeting of this group uh, that we lovingly call the chartographers, uh, which is those who are thinking about redrafting the UN Charter. Um, and the first goal of that meeting was to break the taboo on discussions around charter reform. Um, there are a lot who fear the notion of charter reform, uh, whether because they, uh, well, there are many, many reasons, but most of them have to do with a, a fear of what could be lost. Uh, whether it's those who have power, that they would lose some of their power, whether it is those uh, who have little power and are holding on to whatever they can, 
um, there seems to be a, a, quite a, a big fear about this idea of uh, reforming the UN Charter. And yet, on the other hand, it's, it's an inevitability. At some point, it's going to have to happen uh, because the Charter as it stands is, does not fit the needs of humanity today. Um, you can run down from beginning to end. There are elements of <clears throat> power imbalances and privileges and all of these things that I'm sure this crowd is, is quite familiar with. But to broach the topic of charter reform can be quite a, a challenge, uh, as I referenced. And so we thought the first duty would be uh, from this group that's really exploring the issue in depth would be to, to break the taboo. And so we wrote this, this uh, sort of large report on charter reform and a process that we're engaging in, highlighting a couple of the areas of imbalance. And, and then we had an event uh, on the sidelines of the General Assembly Week, High Level Week. Um, and there, uh, you know, one of the one of the authors of a of a piece that that spawned, spawned this one uh, essentially said that this is a, a terrible conversation to have, that there's nothing to be gained and everything to be lost, uh, that it's uh, Pollyanna thinking that we should be having this conversation now when the political situation is as bad as it is, and so Augusto and I were chatting. You know, it's a it's a brilliant person who said this. So we're not just going to say, you know, oh, you're a you're a, a realist and a negative Nelly, and we don't want to engage with you. We thought, well, let, let's see, what is it that that he's we think he's really saying? So we thought, let's respond to this piece, which was published in Past Blue, which is a, a UN nerd uh, publication, digital publication, um, and we thought, let's let's draft some kind of a response. <clears throat> and the initial thought in any response piece is to try to pick it apart argument by argument and state how it's wrong. But that's not really the approach that we thought was most constructive. What we thought was more constructive would, were to say, there are elements of that argument that we cannot agree with more. Um, and then there are elements of that argument that we think actually could set us backwards, but they happen at different levels. So if we want to actually do a full charter overhaul now, yeah, it's, it's possible that we would lose more than we would gain. Um, so that's that's something that we would have to articulate and consider. But that's not the only, it's not a binary question. It's not a yes or no. So what are we really talking about when we're thinking about the, the summit of the future and the form of global governance? Well, we thought there's more than one conversation and, and part of the challenge of civil society is that we are having more than one conversation, but all at the same time. Yeah. So we're offering recommendations that are, you must do what you promised, that are also, we must reform this, and that are also, the whole system needs to be burned to the ground. You can't have those three conversations at the same time and expect people to know what to do with it. I mean, that's three very different approaches. And so we said, let's actually articulate this. Let's say, you know, maybe it is Pollyanna to be thinking about charter reform at this moment of, of great crisis, and I don't need to list the crises to this group, but let's actually articulate what are those three kinds of paths that we could be considering and that maybe we want to consider as an offer for the summit of the future. Um, and maybe it would help crystallize some of the thinking about, you know, the, the muddled thinking that, that we have, we being Dan and Augusto who, who co-wrote this, but also that others probably have. What are we really trying to achieve with this? Are we trying to get nations to promise to do what they've already said they're going to do? That's actually a big part of the first draft of the Pact for the Future, which is just repeated uh, reaffirmations of the things that, that have already been said. Is that is that enough? Is that th the best we can do? And maybe the answer is yes. And actually, if the world, if the, the governments did what they've already promised to do, we'd be in a way better situation. So there's legitimacy to that idea. <clears throat> the second one is, well, these institutions are okay, but maybe we can modify the institutions as they stand now to do things a little bit better. So maybe it's upgrading the, the Commission on the Status of Women to a council, like what they did with the, the Human Rights Commission that turned into a Human Rights Council. And I'm not saying that that's the only one or that's one that we're advocating for, but it's just an easy example to think about, giving it a couple more uh, legislative powers or normative powers, some subsidiary bodies that could work on that issue. Maybe it's actually just reforming the institutions, maybe even scrapping some of them saying we don't need this commission or that, that committee because they're redundant or because what have you. That's like, you know, going a little bit deeper than just reaffirmation, but it's not burning the whole system to the ground and rebuilding. But then the third path that we thought, so that's, that's a viable path in some situations as well. <clears throat> and maybe that's where we would put security council reform at this moment. We might say, if you add a few members, if you eliminate the veto, these are institutional things. 
that are, I, I don't think they're gonna change the world dramatically because it's still built on the same foundations, but it's not just reaffirming. It's like somewhere in that middle ground. And then the third path is this huge thing about, you know, what are the underlying assumptions of progress? What is the point of the UN? What is it that, that, is, that are the main crises that humanity is going to be facing today and in the coming decades? And for that one, it actually requires a whole deep rethink. At the end of the <clears throat> of World War II, um, there was, of course, you know, 50 countries. It's multiplied by four now. But even, even more profoundly than that, the, the understanding of progress was somewhat linear, that you would go from this type of country eventually to be the, the capitalist democracy that the United States was, is. Um, so, you know, that's that's sort of the, the, the idea behind the UN. It was very much modeled along this, this notion of progress that is accumulation based, that is power based. Um, but I think that now we see that's not actually the way the world can can be sustained. The idea of, of perpetual consumption is ruining uh, the, the planet in many ways. And so maybe we actually need to rethink at a fun, fundamental level. But that's a whole other question. And that's actually very difficult to have uh, at, at this particular moment. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't have it. In large part, what we were saying is we need to start having this conversation as civil society so that one day when the governments, when the moment is right, they have somewhere to turn. They say this is a different, a different way of thinking rather than just saying, oh my gosh, we've blown the whole thing and we've got nothing to turn to. So then <clears throat> I think that the, the, the end salvo is essentially saying that we can't let the, the, the size of the mountain inhibit our progress up it. So there are some things that are quick wins, do the thing you promised, maybe a couple of institutional reforms are quick, some of them are not so quick, but also we need that deeper one and we need to have that conversation. To say it's <clears throat> Pollyanna and therefore not to have it would be a huge disservice, particularly to future generations for whom in many cases we are working. I mean, we, we know that the changes are not gonna happen in the coming you know, year or two, much as we wish they might, but we have to be laying this groundwork so that later we can get there. You can't just expect to climb the, the, the summit of the mountain. <clears throat> you have to do the hard work at the beginning to get up there. And I think that's essentially what we're saying is let's do all three. Let's know when we're doing which one and let's not ignore the, the big one because it's big, because actually precisely because it's big is the reason why we can't ignore it. Um, so perhaps that has been too much time. I haven't been keeping track, uh, but I will, I'll leave it there. I suspect there are some, some questions or some uh, comments that would uh, question what we've written. And that's great. I mean, that's part of it is that we're putting out um, ideas in the hope that people can engage them and, and challenge them and converse with them. And then we'll see where they go. So thanks so much for the opportunity. And I look forward to your questions as well as hearing from others. Mute. James, you're on mute. Yeah. Yes, apologies. Thank you, Dan. Uh, terrifically informative, great article. Uh, by the way, really looking forward to questions later um, and to get into discussion. Um, so with that uh, um, presentation um, done, I would like to ask um, Larry uh, Whitner um, to uh, come forward next. Sorry, my, I'm all over the place with my notes. Um, uh, I think we skipped over Alex. I think it's and the order is Alex, um, me, and then Larry. Uh, there was some changes to the oh. um, there was some changes to the uh, running order. Alex requested to go at the end because he thought oh, it might be late. okay. So we revised. Um, apologies uh, to everyone. Okay, no, um, always skip to you, Alex. Sorry. Okay, so um, I would start again. Um, I'm glad to introduce Larry Whitner. Um, of course, many of us know Larry well. Uh, Larry is a professor of uh, history um, at. Uh, Emeritus at uh, State University of New York at Albany and is the author of Confronting the Bomb and other books on international issues. Larry is, of course, a board member, as he's already mentioned, of Citizens for Global Solutions Education Fund. Um, today, Larry will be speaking about his article, How to Strengthen Global Governance, sorry, How Strengthened Global Governance Could Produce a Nuclear Free World. Um, again, the article is in the chat. Larry, please take it away with your thoughts. Uh, please give us about 10 minutes and we'll come back for questions at the end. Uh, yes, um, I wasn't quite sure how to uh, uh, handle this in, in that I, I didn't know whether uh, people actually uh, read the article first or had no idea uh, what was in it. Uh, and therefore, uh, I decided to, to uh, summarize it 
uh, but not simply uh, go through the whole argument there. Um, the first point, of course, is obvious uh, to us and to most people, uh, uh, namely that uh, nuclear war uh, provides a key, uh, perhaps the key danger to the uh, survival of human civilization. Uh, currently, there are nine uh, nuclear powers that are engaged uh, in the uh, nuclear arms race. Uh, a new one, in, in, in fact, that is the old one that had uh, declined a, uh, somewhat thanks to uh, popular protest, but they're again moving forward with the escalation of the uh, uh, drive for uh, uh, new and more uh, devastating and accurate uh, nuclear weapons. Um, there's a military uh, confrontation that uh, currently exists uh, between uh, nuclear powers uh, um, in uh, Ukraine. Uh, there are uh, conflicts between uh, two nuclear powers on the India-Pakistan uh, border. Uh, there's a, a, a conflict uh, in the uh, South China Sea that involves uh, powers with uh, nuclear weapons. And uh, furthermore, uh, there are national leaders that are issuing uh, public threats uh, of launching a nuclear war against one another's nations. Uh, these threats aren't entirely new, but I think we've been uh, lulled, lulled, lulled into uh, some degree of, of optimism or uh, complacency um, when those uh, threats uh, ceased with the Cold War. But uh, we're back to uh, hearing those uh, threats made by, by people like uh, Vladimir Putin or uh, Kim Jong-un or uh, uh, Donald Trump. Um, and uh, consequently, the uh, Bolton of the Atomic Scientists, which has since 1946 um, been using a, a doomsday clock to um, symbolize the, the um, uh, closeness we have come to uh, a nuclear destruction, uh, uh, the editors of the bulletin have uh, set the doomsday uh, clock at uh, 90 seconds to midnight. Uh, the closest ever to uh, uh, world annihilation, uh, thanks to nuclear war. Um, now, the experience of the past um, has actually been uh, fairly hopeful, at least for a time. Um, the uh, first nuclear arm uh, was launched during World War II and uh, continued at a ferocious uh, tempo during the uh, Cold War. Um, but uh, many of you uh, remember the tumultuous nuclear disarmament movements of that time of the uh, Cold War period, uh, led by groups like SANE, the National uh, Committee for SANE Nuclear Policy in, in the United States, or uh, the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament in Britain, or the uh, struggle against atomic death uh, in West Germany, uh, and others around the world. Um, uh, as well as individuals, uh, some of whom were closely uh, connected uh, with the World Federalist Movement, such as Norman Cousins or uh, Bertrand Russell. Uh, and they uh, challenged uh, this nuclear arms race and were uh, remarkably uh, successful in uh, halting it, at least for a time, and then fostering a sub-measure of nuclear arms control and disarmament, a, a, a series of uh, treaties uh, and voluntary measures that uh, sharply reduced the number uh, of nuclear weapons and the uh, danger of nuclear war. Uh, I studied this uh, resistance to nuclear weapons in a, a massive uh, research project that led to my uh, scholarly trilogy called The uh, Struggle Against the Bomb, uh, and the abbreviated version that James mentioned, uh, Confronting the Bomb, which is what most people read since they can't, can't bear to uh, plow through this, this, this vast uh, scholarly uh, trilogy. Uh, and the uh, trilogy was, and the research project it, itself, uh, were based on uh, formerly uh, secret government records, interviews with government officials, and uh, public sources. And it showed uh, conclusively, I think, uh, that this uh, popular movement, uh, driven by recognition of the immense danger of 
weapons, um, succeeded in uh, forcing governments to uh, curb the nuclear arms race and uh, avoid nuclear war. Um, the number of nuclear weapons was uh, reduced from 70,000 to some uh, 13,000, uh, and the likelihood of nuclear war declined. Uh, however, uh, as the nuclear uh, menace uh, declined, uh, the movement also uh, declined. And with the popular uh, pressure reduced, uh, governments felt uh, freer uh, to begin uh, once more building uh, the most powerful weapons, uh, nuclear weapons, and uh, threatening one another uh, with nuclear war. Um, the reason for this nuclear revival is one, um, uh, we should understand, of course, uh, as world federalists, and that is that uh, a popular uh, pressure uh, built on the uh, danger posed by nuclear weapons is important, but ultimately uh, not sufficient, for it doesn't destroy the underlying cause of the nuclear arms race, uh, namely the uh, drive for national security amid the anarchy of nations. But uh, what if global governance was uh, strengthened to the extent that it, it could uh, provide national security? What if the United Nations were transformed from a loose confederation of nations into a, a, a genuine federation of nations, uh, enabled thereby to uh, create binding international law, uh, prevent international aggression, and uh, guarantee uh, treaty uh, commitments? including uh, commitments uh, for nuclear disarmament. Uh, wouldn't the public and uh, policymakers alike uh, conclude that nuclear weapons, which they already know are immensely dangerous, have also become unnecessary? Um, under a global federation of nations, um, no longer uh, would nations be uh, free to sign on or off uh, to nuclear disarmament treaties as they are um, to the uh, 2016 uh, UN treaty on the uh, prohibition of nuclear weapons. Instead, nuclear disarmament legislation would simply be federal law enforced by the world federal government with individuals in violation arrested as criminals. Uh, furthermore, uh, the legislation's uh, universal applicability um, would offset uh, current fears that nations complying with the Nuclear Disarmament Treaty would one day be attacked by nations that refuse to uh, sign it or abide by it. Um, what I'm uh, suggesting in that piece, and generally in the uh, Struggle Against the Bomb trilogy, is that if the world is to be saved from uh, global destruction uh, through nuclear war, it will require mobilizing the public and public officials around both the danger posed by nuclear weapons, which of course we shouldn't uh, forget and we should uh, continue to emphasize, uh, but also around how World Federation can provide the key to maintaining national security uh, and thus uh, provides us with a, um, a, a better path toward a nuclear weapons free world. So I'll stop here. Perfect timing, Larry. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so I will now ask um, Alex uh, McIsaac um, to speak to us about his article. Um, Alex was born in Canada, but raised around uh, the world, which has shaped his commitment to the creation of world federal government. Alex has a master's degree in specializing in international organizations and global public policy from the Melbourne Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University and founded the Global Federalist Association at the University of Toronto. Among others, Alex worked for, the elect for Elections Canada for five years before being appointed as executive director um, at the World Federalist Movement Canada in 2021. Alex is the author of the article, In Defense of an Idealist Approach to UN at Four. A link, as ever, to the article is in the chat. Alex, please take us away, um, about 10 minutes as before, and then we'll come back for discussion and chat. Thanks so much, James. Um, so as James said, uh, my article's name is uh, In Defense of an Idealist Approach to UN Reform. 
Uh, the name is pretty self-evident. In many ways, the article defends the World Federalist approach to reforming the UN Security Council and other international institutions. So uh, the argument here is that the biggest challenge for us as World Federalists is that uh, people tend to view our proposals as overly ambitious and uh, blinded by optimism. Uh, these critics uh, that they call themselves uh, pragmatic, they tend to identify smaller existing details of the UN and try to work within its structure. Uh, the argument here is that even though they call themselves pragmatic, it's not necessarily the most uh, efficient way. So those two don't necessarily go hand in hand. Uh, the problem is that there's a fundamental flaw built into the UN system. Um, one of them is notably the uh, five permanent seats of the Security Council, which is uh, in many ways a remnant of the Second World War, representing the five victors of it. And uh, that structure is really stuck in uh, what we call institutional inertia. So it's unable to change, unable to adapt to de developments in our increasingly globalized world community. So addressing issues like climate change was not really on the minds of the founders of the United Nations, but we, as we see, has become one of the gravest threats to our world. There's other issues as well, such as uh, nuclear weapons, which uh, I'll go into uh, a bit later. Um, so within the structure, pragmatic reforms, they seek to establish various targets uh, for emissions to avoid global warming and other environmental disaster thresholds. And I think we can all agree that uh, continuously setting up these targets and failing to achieve these targets at different stages uh, it would be insane to think that we can continue this approach and find a global solution by just setting new targets through resolutions, treaties, and all of these which nations can simply uh, back out of at any time. So uh, the argument's central thesis is to tackle uh, the structure instead, which would be more efficient, and to not give up on a more idealistic approach to UN reform because um, working within a system that is um, innately flawed uh, is not going to get us anywhere. Uh, so uh, the article also mentions uh, very clearly that um, the five permanent members of the Security Council all possess nuclear weapons. So to find a way that um, all five of them would not veto something uh, to um, go towards nuclear uh, non-proliferation or disarmament, would be kind of lunacy. And I do include that uh, quote by uh, Don Quixote in there, which um, I could uh, read right now. Sorry, I just got to find the page. Okay. So when life itself seems lunatic, who knows where badness lies? Perhaps to be too practical is madness. To surrender dreams, this may be madness. Too much sanity may be madness. And maddest of all, to see life as it is and not as it should be. So uh, that's uh, really uh, my thesis for uh, my approach also to WFM Canada efforts and uh, to uh, actually building a world community and a new international system or a world system that would work better for all of us. Shreya, um, and these are some very hard acts to follow, but I think this is going to be a little bit of a gear shift. Um, it was really exciting for me writing this article with my uh, dear friend and constant inspiration, Nutara Youssef, who was one of the co-chairs of the Civil Society Conference in Nairobi, and is here with us not just in spirit, but in accessories in the form of the earrings that she gave me from coming out of that process alive. <laughs> um, I don't know if you can see those. Is Dan still on the call? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and I didn't get any earrings. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I'm I'm sure they're they're waiting for you back in New York. Um, what was really exciting to me is that this links so directly to where I think CGS and our partners' place in the world can be right now, and some of the fault lines, and some of the opportunities, and some of the apertures for change if we choose to seize them, if we choose to meet the moment, if we choose to make moments, and if we choose to maximize the moments that present themselves to us. 
Um, and so while we wrote this article, we were prognosticating um, both about the Summit of the Future, which, as was mentioned, um, is in September. Um, and, and David, you're very correct that I, I don't think that there's widespread awareness um, of the Summit of the Future or the process leading up to it or beyond. And as much as possible, we hope to play that conduit role and bring Nairobi and New York to our members um, and, um, and and involve you in all of these processes. And we can talk concretely about what some of those opportunities might look like. Um, and um, now we're in a position where Nairobi has just happened. Um, Dan and I have just returned from the Civil Society Summit. Uh, so I can give a little bit of a readout um, of that process and then talk a bit about my hopes um, and um, I, I'm, I'm not really good. I'm not, um, I'm not a better, I'm not a gambler. So um, I won't put any cards on the table in terms of what I think um, will come out of September, but I can say what we can strive for to come out of September and most importantly beyond to ensure that the summit of the future is not just a flashpoint, but a tipping point for um, meaningful UN reform. It has been hailed as a once in a generation opportunity for uh, UN reform, but if it is just a two-day conference and it is just um, a lot of sound and fury signifying nothing, as has happened with other uh, conferences, of course, that's not the case. Our friends, um, one of them among us, chief um, uh, at the Coalition for the UN We Need, have done Herculean work to ensure that is not the case and in any way possible that civil society can play an active role in these processes that we do and we, um, we have thus far. Um, so uh, just a little bit of background, I won't go into too much detail, but the Summit of the Future um, had the meeting of which uh, was originally recommended by the Secretary General in 2023 with the SDG Summit, and then um, somewhat acrimonious negotiations among uh, some states led to it being postponed to 2024 and uh, in September. And then at the midway point in May, just now, um, there was the Nairobi Civil Society Conference. Now, while there's a UN Civil Society Conference every year, this was quite um, this was quite special, and it was positive as a unique opportunity for civil society to assert its right to co-author the multilateralism we need in the face of unprecedented global challenges and momentous paradigm shifts. Um, and while the it, the influence, um, the yeah. well, the outcomes of the civil society conference will have on, uh, sorry, well, the lasting influence the outcomes of the civil society conference will have on member states, I think, um, are yet to come out in the wash. One thing that I am confident of is the success in galvanizing civil society. Um, and as a democratic world federalists believing in people powered global governance, I think we all can appreciate that this is an um, an end in, in and of itself. Um, now, I am not quite sure if these are the correct numbers, Dan, but there will be an outcome document forthcoming that will that we will share with all of our members um, in newsletter or other format. Um, but I, what I have currently, Dan, is uh, there, there were more than 2,500 civil society leaders and other stakeholders participating from 115 countries and the majority from the African continent, more or less. All right. Okay. Approximately. Um, and I won't go too far into the modalities of the conference, but I think an overview is helpful because I think there it gives a very good um, uh, structure and framework for understanding how um, the collective civil society um, actors involved are looking at this process. So one of the key outcomes of the Summit of the Future is a pact for the future. And it's accompanied by two annexes, a declaration for future generations um, and a global digital compact. And the pact for the future has five chapters, uh, sustainable development and uh, financing for development, peace and security, science, technology, innovation, and digital technology. No, there can't be technology twice. Youth and future generations and transforming global governance. I'm always nervous doing this in front of Dan. Um, and so, the uh, first day of the um, of the conference focused on zooming in on these five chapters of the Pact for the Future, 
and um, uh, making some civil society recommendations there too. At the point of which the conference happened, we had moved from a zero, we were at a zero draft of the pact, which was 20 pages, which was published in January after a process among states led by Germany and Namibia. And now um, uh, shortly after, and then over the course of the intervening months, it had ballooned at one point um, uh, to 242 pages um, with a lot of ad additions and deletions. Now um, we are at version one and we are back to 20 pages um, due to some magic of font size and the um, uh, elimination for now of a chapeau. Um, and the second day of the conference focused on the formation and coalescence of impact coalitions. Now, this is a, a very unique innovation. Um, and um, I, I think one of the most critical elements of the, not only the conference, but of a way of organizing um, as civil society. Um, at CGS and WFM and WFM Canada, we have been involved, we are all about coalitions um, since our inception. Um, we are part of the World Federalist Movement. We led um, the coalition for the ICC. Um, we're, we've always been supporters of the C4UN, one for eight billion, et cetera. Um, this takes that to another level and it aims to be more inclusive and appreciate also not just mono issues, um, but the intersectionality of an array of uh, topics and um, new concerns and new challenges and new opportunities. Um, everything from AI um, to arts and culture to some more that I'll zoom in in a minute that we're, um, we're intimately involved in. Um, and of course, UN Charter Reform being one of those that we are very supportive of. Um, and uh, to tell you a little bit about how important these impact coalitions can and I hope will be, I trust will be, and the closing remarks um, that uh, Secretary General Guterres um, surprised us with his presence um, and affirmed that the impact coalitions pr promise a new era of engagement. These models of collaboration span ages, regions, and sectors, and focus civil society's energy and expertise for maximum impact on the challenges we face. So to zoom in and make this a little bit more tangible, um, and also to completely self-promote what CGS is working on, not really, but I think it's a good example. Um, one of the coalitions that we're co-convening is this Just Institutions and um, the International Court of Justice. And um, over the last couple of weeks, um, particularly on Friday, um, well, that was just yesterday, um, this the need for such a coalition, I think, has never been more pronounced. Um, the expectation of accountability in a rules-based rules -based world order was foundational um, to the international system, predating the UN Charter, but um, uh, a, a keystone element of the UN Charter. And now with, the, um, with conflicts raging in every region, with atrocities going unchecked, um, the power of international justice system uh, to uh, resolve disputes in a Pacific rather than bellicose manner um, has never been more vital and never been more challenged. And so this impact coalition uh, explores tangible ways to bolster the international judicial system. The ICJ is mentioned as the central organ, uh, central judicial organ of the UN system, but it includes a, well, as well the International Criminal Court, um, the International Tribunal of the Law and of the Sea and other tribunals. And it lost, um, as it's abbreviated, came out with a very seminal opinion um, a couple of weeks ago on the obligations of states with regards to climate change, showing just how progressive and um, valuable the judicial institutions can be in reframing um, a state notion of obligations and responsibilities. Um, uh, the ICJ is seized of a similar case, um, stretching, of course, beyond the maritime. Um, and as well, we're contemplating new institutions, such as an international anti-corruption court, which has its own impact coalition, which we also co-convene, um, given that it is, uh, it has um, a lot of momentum already behind it. It already had um, a, a quite significant backing um, and global 
reach um, of support. Um, and that is uh, one of the interesting things about these impact coalitions. Some of them came to Nairobi almost fully formed and using the opportunity to recruit more and more diverse voices to the movement. Some of them were at the complete other end of the spectrum and um, didn't know if there would be somebody who would be interested in their subject matter. And some of them actually formed there. And over time, and actually already happening, some of these are coalescing, um, some of them are proliferating, and we're certainly trying our best to all collaborate. There is obviously a great degree of commonality um, and uh, intersectionality between many of these um, areas. And I hope that maybe somebody can put the list of the impact coalitions in the chat. Um, Dre, you know where it is? I'll, I'll get it afterwards then, after I start, stop talking. Um, and this uh, impact coalition links very closely to the campaign that you might have heard us talk about before at CGS, Legal Alternatives to War, Law Not War, echoing the words of our late um, National Advisory Council member, the great Ben Ferenz. Um, and we aim through both that campaign and the Impact Coalition to raise awareness of the, um, the successes and the importance of the International Court of Justice um, to make uh, to help states make better use of the court. And I can explain in more detail what that might mean. Um, I won't get too into the weeds now in the interest of time. Um, and also to help the court help itself. Um, in the same way that the coalition for the ICC continues to play an invaluable role in um, ongoing ICC evolution, everything from procedures to the election selection of judges, um, to keep it uh, legitimate, credible, and honest um, and efficient, um, so too the ICJ might need a little, could benefit from a little help in that regard. Um, other coalitions in which we're involved are the Earth Governance Alliance, which corresponds to our MEGA, a Mobilizing Earth Governance Alliance project. Um, and we are very supportive as well, um, as I said, of UN Charter Reform, Inclusive Global Governance, um, Future Generations. Um, the list kind of goes on, and I wish I could be at, um, uh, so there are two sessions with, with 10 coalitions at a time, and there are too many rooms that I wanted to be in, Dan, but I know you did your best, um, so you can't clone yourself. Um, and I will put the list in there. And if anybody would like to be involved in any of these, the idea is not in any way to restrict to those who are able to make it to Nairobi, those who are able to be in um, uh, in New York in September. Um, it's, I think, to bring in the people who aren't in the rooms where it happens to a large extent and to get um, and I more... Uh, a harmonious chorus um, with uh, a larger uh, cast of characters. Um, and I will show you how to um, join, or you could just email me. And in addition to those I highlighted, of course, there are many others that um, if they pique your interest and your um, fields of expertise, um, feel free to reach out. So these will co continue to be incubated informally from May to September as a, a support system to champion member states. Um, and then there will be civil society action days at the summit of the future. And we hope that these coalitions live on in some ways. Um, we will be publishing updates on the um, uh, Just Institutions and Earth Governance uh, coalitions through our newsletters. Um, the there there's the law not war newsletter and a mega newsletter that will uh, now become kind of coalition letter newsletters for the time being at least um and we're going to host a number of events through september and beyond um that will be um remote entirely or in some cases hybrid um so with that um i will just look to my friend who is now the emeritus um, uh, convener of the impact coalitions to see the, if he's smiling or frowning. Okay. Um, and I'll close my remarks and I would love to, um, talk further about how to engage all CGS members, WFM Canada members, anybody who, who would like to be a part of these processes. 
Fantastic, Rebecca. Thanks very much. Um, really great insight there into what's going on. So lots of thought provoking ideas that suggest ways forward on vital issues for the world. Um, to quickly summarize, Dan has spoken to us about UN reform and the three paths forward that he foresees. Larry has reviewed how to strengthen global governance um, that could uh, produce nucle a nuclear free world. Alex has described his thesis in defense of an idealist approach to UN reform. And Rebecca has spoken about the themes in her article towards the summit of the future, uh, building the UN we need, and updated us about recent civil society progress made around impact coalitions at the Nairobi UN Civil Society Conference and other developments. I would now like to open up the session for questions from the audience and for anyone who has a question to any of our special guests today. Um, remember, please, to try to keep your comments to two minutes um, and questions. Um, so raise your hand. I see first um, on my screen, I have David and then Carla May. David, would you like to kick us off with a question? Sure. I was wondering how uh, Dan and Alex would uh, react to Joseph Schwartzberg's plan for UN reform through weighted voting. Okay, should we get a response and then we'll come to Carla May, unless Carla May, you have a question on this, a similar topic? No, okay, so uh, David and, um, sorry, uh, Alex and Dan. Dan, you want me to go first, I guess? That's the point. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, so weighted voting is an interesting idea. Uh, are you referring to that at the Security Council or at the General Assembly? Both. Uh, both, yeah. Uh, so one of the big ideas uh, within this idealistic approach that I'm proposing is to provide uh, alternative forms or alternative models to what we have currently to fulfill the purposes of the Security Council. And one of those is the United Nations Parliamentary Assembly, where uh, we would have some sort of world assembly where we directly um, elect members that represent us at that stage. And uh, that comes with a lot of considerations, of course, where um, you know some countries are much more populous than others, and it would not necessarily be one country, one vote. Uh, there would be representatives from different regions, and some regions might be grouped in together. So uh, one of the common things that I would like to see is to have uh, some sort of uh, voting structure or member structure that goes beyond national boundaries. So we would probably have some sort of coalition between, uh, say, the Conservative Party in Canada and the Republican Party in the United States and divide up um, electoral districts where we would have um, some voting together. And then we would have the Liberal Party in Canada uh, also forming one electoral district with um, others, uh, such as the uh, Democratic Party and the Green Party in Canada as well, the Neo-Democratic Party. And um, yeah, so we would have that, but there would also be the idea that China and India have very large populations, and we would have to take that into consideration. Uh, so China might even have two seats within there, and some of those seats might not cross over national boundaries. There's, um, yeah, uh, and finally, um, these groupings would create uh, some sort of new um, basis for democratic representation of the world community. And the idea is that we wouldn't have one country, one vote, and we would have to take in not only population considerations, but geographical representations, uh, cultural uh, considerations as well, and uh, just regional more broadly. Maybe quick, yeah, I just want to quickly jump in. Yeah, I think that that at a level of principle, I think that there are good elements to weighted voting. Um, <clears throat> I do wonder, though, about, um, you know, for example, the small island countries uh, who are suffering quite a bit at the hands of things that they have not caused and what, what would be their uh, capacity to retain um, their their strength and their power at the international level. I think that it would be much worse at the international level if we did not have them sort of disproportionately uh, voiced. And and so I'm not I'm not saying good or bad on any of the things. It's just these are the questions that we have to start to consider. The other one is about the assumptions about how how it's weighted, not just like is it a log scale or not, but also is it weighted purely based on population 
because you know if, if this isn't off the record but you know if you're thinking about a large country that's a one party system does that mean that they should be more influential than smaller countries that are multi party like it's it's just these things need to to kind of come into the into our thinking last thing i'll say is about the assumption of the the state uh and the westphalian model as the model that will carry us into the future um and it's kind of limitations uh if your first loyalty is to your you know your geographic border then what do you do to your neighbors uh, i think that these are questions that have to be considered as we're considering the benefits and drawbacks of weighted voting, which may prove to be far more democratic and representative, but it may also not. A lot of it, a lot of this devil is in the details. And so I think what matters to me is more the, the conceptual underpinnings um, that would lead us to consensus or, or agreement anyway, about what a better system might look like, which may include weighted voting. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Carla May. My question is more more uh, general. I would like to know what is the audience for Mondial? For Mondial, what what is who gets this? Is this uh, a preaching to the choir, or does this malleable research and the authorship we have heard about is it seed for those who haven't a ghost of a notion of what we're talking about and should have more than a ghost of a notion of what we're talking about? So I go back to my basic question: What is the who is the audience for this publication, or where should it be? Great. Well, luckily on the call we have Rebecca and Alex, chiefs of our respective. And I was uh, actually going to say Erica would be a perfect person to to start us off, and uh, happy to chip in with Alex as well. But I think Erica should take this one. Yeah, I'm happy to answer that, and Alex can speak to it as well because this is exactly what we've been brainstorming with some of the developments we've made. So currently, I think uh, on the Canadian side, we send it out to about 500 people. Those are our members. That's a part of paying your membership dues. Uh, but we also have partnerships with libraries uh, and are exploring more organic ways to expand the publication's reach. We're looking for ways to engage students at universities um, and even Family members of longtime members of the organizations have, you know, found unique avenues to find our publication and realize that it resonates with their own values that relate to uh, causes that they pursue at organizations that they're affiliated with. And we've made connections that way. Um, Alex, would you want to talk about some of the, if there's anything I've missed, please? Yeah, no, I think you set up really well. Um, so the vast majority of the copies that we actually print out here at WFM Canada do go out to our members uh, that have requested it specifically and some of our donors as well. So it is in that sense uh, very much preaching to the choir, but we do, as Eric also mentioned, uh, drop it off at some public libraries uh, that request it. So there are volumes there for anyone to access. Uh, we also have a deal with uh, EBCO host and we um, also um, distributed to universities as well. So um, in addition to that, uh, we bring some copies, of course, to events, and we have newcomers there, so they have an uh, tend to get a better idea of what the movement is about and can get uh, involved that way. Uh, I myself also bring these copies to a uh, little uh, shop which sells magazines and publications uh, down the road. It's called Presse Internationale, uh, International Press, and they um, just put them on display uh, to be given out uh, for free to the public. So I drop off about 15 a week and they're always gone by the time I go back. So that's very nice. Um, and on the U.S. side, uh, we, we also send to our members um, all of these conferences that I go to or, or any event. Um, I have to add a couple pounds to my luggage allocation for the Mondials. And then um, in Nairobi, um, I not only put some out on the table, but I was sitting and talking for, to people from every region about what world federalism is, how does the, which article, you know, most prescribes to their um, uh, specific area of interest um, and uh, their, what they're pushing for and advocating for. Um, we have a much stronger online presence as well. And I know not everybody um, uh, is as um, uh, 
familiar or, or happy in, in reading uh, a journal online, but it is so much clearer. And I, I commend um, um, our IT director, Alex, um, different Alex, um, uh, for doing such a wonderful job. We're now um, on the website. You can access each article individually. Each article then gets its own promotion across all of our social media threads. But also, we have pretty extensive networks, um, whether it be in the international justice community or whether it be now in the uh, environmental community, who might be adjacent to these ideas of world federalism, um, but have not contemplated them head on. And so I think it's a mix of, um, yes, preaching to the choir, keeping them up to date with what, 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 that this is not, this idea is not going away. It's not dying. We're still doing things. We're still relevant. And then the middle, those folks who intersect, but don't dire directly think about democratic world federation. And then what we need to do more of is what our friends up North are doing so well um, and reaching schools, universities, libraries, and, and that's on the plan. Um, down, down the line, um, James and co have been doing wonderful work in outreach to universities. And so this is part of our strategy of um, engaging them. And if you have any suggestions, um, we'd be happy to take those on board. Fantastic. Donna, you have your hand up. Go. Yeah, I might just add on the US side that Larry Whitner's article, I believe, was also uh, published uh, through Peace Voice Syndicate. Larry leads a team for CTS, a breaking news response team that submits articles such as the one he wrote and is in Mondial that goes out to smaller media around the country, he, uh, both print and um, electronic, I believe, online. So I just might add that as well. Okay, any more questions from the floor at this time? Don't see any hands yeah. up. Oh, Donna, go for it. Um, yeah, uh, I just want to, I guess, just comment on uh, Coalition for the UN We Need and tell Dan how much we appreciate the work he's done for so long. Uh, I think it was initially called UN 2020. Was that how it started? And I remember uh, CGS got engaged with that and did some of the, um, put together our package. And um, I don't I don't know if you want to say anything about the coalition for the UN we need, Dan, its current work or its evolution, or I don't know. I just thought I wanted to acknowledge that your work and thank all of you who worked so long and hard to get the civil society voice out there. I mean, if you want me to talk about it, I'm happy to. I know Rebecca has already shared quite a bit though, so I, I don't want to oversaturate the space. Okay, I'm getting some please talk uh, motions from others. Uh, so yeah, in in at the onset of the UN seventy five process, without getting into a super long history, uh, it became clear that there was going to there were going to be interesting conversations around UN reform. Um, and interestingly, uh, Maria Fernanda Espinosa was the president of the General Assembly at that time when the UN seventy five process started. She then became one of the first co-chairs uh, of the Coalition for the UN We Need after uh, the, the 75th anniversary of the UN. So it was called UN 2020, and then it turned into the Coalition for the UN We Need. And essentially now it serves as a platform for civil society uh, and academia and uh, you know anybody who wants. In, in fact, uh, member states themselves uh, turned to seat for UN for uh, the latest information through an information bulletin that we have uh, about each of the, the meetings where we can get information, which isn't all of them. Um, but we are trying to serve as a platform for engagement in the, the um, Summit of the Future process and really many of the processes that are born from our common agenda, which is a report that was written by the Secretary General uh, at the 76th anniversary of the UN. Um, so, you know, the work is really to provide a point of access. There was no civil society focal point or network uh, that was acting in order to channel civil society towards these processes. And so that's the breach that C4UN has stepped into. Uh, now we have the, the, the wonderful bounty and, and struggle of many people being super interested in the summit of the future and now claiming some form of territory and and uh you know authority in the space and you know we're all trying to do the right thing uh, we just haven't figured out as humanity how to do the right thing together 
Um, but I think that as we are as we are seeing more and more people interested in the summit of the future, it's actually it's a good problem for us to be addressing. Uh, but C for UN has been there for for the longest. Uh, if it hasn't necessarily done the best because we are uh, a humble group that is trying to do what we can. But um, we continue uh, through these these bulletins, which are there's an information clearinghouse is what it's called, the ICH bulletin. Uh, that you can read in the C4UN website, which is occasionally updated. Uh, and then we have a couple of other initiatives, one of them being uh, what's called a People's Pact for the Future, which will be a corollary to the uh, Pact for the Future that the member states are negotiating. We hope to finalize that in uh, roughly two weeks' time uh, so that it can be used as a tool for advocacy and uh, information sharing about what civil society would like to see come from the summit of the future in order to hopefully influence the pact uh, and the member states who are going to take it forward regardless of the outcome documents. Uh, hopefully they can continue to engage with these ideas beyond September. Um, so that's in large part the work of the coalition. I see there's websites being populated in the chat box and um, you know we're all serving in the different ways we can. So it's just a, a privilege to have the opportunity. Thank, uh, you. thank you, Dan. Um, Donna, did you have a follow up there? No. OK, call me, please. Um, thank you so much, Dan, and also Rebecca for um, answering that question. I, I, when, when I first learned of the possible renovations for the UN through the work of Dave Auten and some others, and of course, the Constitution for the Federation of Earth, I sent a gathering of materials to my NGO representative at the UN, the reply was, it's not the right time. So my question is, is there anything possibly can be done with that body that underpins the Security Council called the NGOs? Is anything possible to awaken that group of people from all over the world to what is the creative thought going on here? Great, do we have any comments from the authors? I mean, I don't wanna like overburden the space, but this is basically what I do all the time. Uh, and I think that this is the, the, the question that we have to ask everybody, not just civil society that's engaged with the UN, but also, just normal citizens that are out there, you know, buying their cars and their TVs and their phones. And, you know, we all have to be thinking about this. And to me, there's two lines of thinking. One is to ask the simple question, do you think that that we have finished our social evolution? Um, and if the answer is yes, then I, I don't know that the person has really thought about the question. If the answer is no, then I think that that's, that's an indicator that something must be done. And so to go at it from this advocacy perspective of we have to do X, we have to reform this, we have to do that, I, I find that that's actually very difficult in terms of theory of change for human beings to engage with. But if it's a simple question of do you think that we're done, uh, I think that they would often say no. And then you can say, okay, great, then what needs to be done? What do you foresee? And then naturally, you know, the, the realization that we are a borderless global family uh, with one earth, that's that comes, that, everybody knows that, but the implications of it are where the gaps lie. Now, in terms of the lack of imagination uh, and, the, and the timing being wrong, that's always going to be true until it's done, right? To use those those very famous quotes, everything's difficult until it is done, but it it's an inevitability. The, cho the choice that we have, in my humble opinion, is whether we do it by choice now, before further catastrophe and other world wars, climate change, do it before, which is definitely my preference, or be prepared because we're going to have to do it after. Either way, we should be taking action. Um, and there's no, there's really no choice. Uh, and I think that to me is the most compelling thing. And, and at the personal level, the ambassadors all know it. Everybody in New York knows it. At the institutional level, it's much more difficult. And so what we need to do is build that kind of momentum of, yes, it may not be the right time because of your institution, but it's a it's a human necessity. And I think that that is a very compelling argument. The question is really, what do we do about it? I think that we prepare. Some think that we have to put out every fire, and that's great. We should be trying to put out the fires and building a new system that is, is uh, immune to fires. We have to do both. 
And so then, then it becomes, where is your value add? Are you treating the emergency right now? If so, fantastic. Are you trying to prepare humanity for the emergencies to come? Also fantastic. It's like it, we, we treat these things as binary when they're they're really not. And so I think that these questions are those that we we here are trying to struggle with every day. So and I'm sorry to over over occupy the space. I'm just coming in a couple of Dan's points um, on timing in particular. You know, if if all the cards were laid out perfectly, we'd already be there. Um, and I echo completely um, your point, Dan, that we can't look at the monolith and, and take our cues from that. Um, we have to look at the separate parts and the separate individuals. And, and um, this is the way that every successful reform, every successful innovation from and, you know, I'll come back to the ICC again. That was a process of decades of advocacy, bilateral, multilateral um, that came up and everybody had a different motivation for coming to the table. And same now, whether your issue is climate change and you're worried about your island going underwater or you're worried about the um, degradation of your airspace by your neighbors um, or whether you are worried about the threat of aggression next door, um, we have different motivations and it is sometimes difficult to bring those up on the floor of the UNGA. But um, there, I think, is a common necessity that is, uh, I hope, realized at the individual human level that I, I think we are in crisis right now. I always um, uh, say that, that I don't think we're waiting for a crisis. We're just waiting for the crisis to become a, I don't know, um, a jumbo crisis. What is, what, what, what's the mega crisis? I don't, I don't want to use that because it, uh, it sound, makes our flagship program sound bad. Um, <laughs> Um, but yes, I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry that you had that experience and, um, I don't think there's ever a wrong time. There just might be the wrong time match with the wrong aperture. And so it's connecting those dots in a smart strategic way. So I would like to follow up, um, ask Carla May a question. When you said you reached out to your NGO, do you mean your, the NG, your religious orders? representative at the UN, is that what you meant? Yes, yes, because, Donna, that, that's, that's who I reached out to, right? Yeah, because actually, I'm so glad you, you said that, because I was thinking of asking Dan Perel a question about how, you know, it's so wonderful that he's a representative of the International Baha'is at the UN, and wondering how, and, and he's involved in trying to push World Federation and that there are other um, religions with representatives at the UN who should be colleagues because they also, um, their, their foundations are also for federating, pulling us all together, one humanity, and, and wondering how, um, how they all might work together in that effort. And, and also to share that WFM, the international coalition that we're a member of, has just created a new transnational working group to reach out to different faith-based organizations. And so Carla May, I might send that invitation to you. I know uh, Dave Auten has already um, joined, but perhaps it might be interesting for you too, to see, you know, that's an, another attempt to try to get faith-based organizations pulling together um, for these changes, so. Thanks, thanks Donna. Also, uh, David has been trying to get our attention. <laughs> David Lionel. Right. Oh, oh, um, sorry. May I first come to Larry because I believe he waved his hand before. Mm -hmm. No, it wasn't Larry. No. Okay, David, please take us away. Uh, Larry, uh, David, sorry, you're on mute. As I tried to say at the beginning, I think the, <clears throat> I, it's wonderful what everybody says here. Uh, great stuff. Um, the thing is that we've been looking for a way, The all of this content, as has been noted at various points, is kind of remote to ordinary people. It, it just is too abstract and often the future often and isn't part of the general discourse at all uh, in people's lives. It just isn't. So what now is suddenly available is this specific project of the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And the key thing about the, them is that all the nation states, everyone, the United States and China and Russia and uh, 
Ukraine and Israel have agreed, committed to manifesting them for their populations. Everybody in their societies is supposed to enjoy these uh, goods, which include uh, peace and environmental uh, protection and uh, universal education and um, uh, social justice institutions. Wow, very important. And the thing is that it's not only a national dimension. It's possible to do this at the community level or even at the campus level. So and so this and it's it's very comprehensive. Seventeen goals is very difficult to to get your hand, head around. I got that, but I it the virtue of that is that it's really complete. And if if any given society or community enjoyed that, or the majority of the population did, <laughs> that would be very good and a big advance over where we are now. And it's. It has a global dimension because everyone has all the nation states have agreed to it and the UN is behind it, but it and it, it could have a national and a local dimension. And I've been at this a long time and uh, my hair wasn't gray when I started in this and it is now. And uh, this, I went to the UN last, uh, last uh, uh, September and it just blew me away how yeah, this is it. I'd heard about, it, of course, before, but the, yeah, this was the finally the way to get the global and the local to coalesce the sustainable development goals. And the key word is implementing the sustainable development goals. Okay. And so that opportunity is there for us to promote. Okay. And that's the key part. We, this is our, finally our way to let everybody in, especially the informed public. I talk about the New York Times reading public or the let alone the Mondial reading public. OK, and, and the people who watch television and uh, news and uh, the kids who are online, social media. So all of these um, outlets of uh, me mechanisms of communication are available to us to uh, if we focus on this project. So what I'm working on and I've just been um uh, identified that the key for me is paid grant paid interns. That's the key to get the outreach, the grunt work, the filling out the forms done by somebody who isn't me. I can do my part, but I just can't do all this stuff. But a whole bunch of little Indians could get this done if a grant paid for them. And I get that that's possible. And I started on that with through Parker Dewey I, I, this last week. And made have made enormous progress by having three people actually working with me who they're paying or they were. Anyway, here we are. So the specific plan is to coalesce many organizations and find funding from the UN Foundation and many other possible places and sponsors who sponsored the Climate Week last year. There's a group of 50 of those who paid money to uh, get their name out at the Climate Week last year to stage major events locally at wherever, Cincinnati, uh, Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, videotape, I'm a video producer for, for uh, 50 years, and edit those, those events and put them on television. Broadcast television, the major station, we can buy time very affordably, shockingly affordably, $1,000 an hour an hour to own it and we can get sponsors to go in there and heavily advertise those those that programming and the idea is to catalyze a group to undertake the project of implementing the sustainable government development goals in their municipality suddenly and there's 167 indicators and the, the sustainable development goals are about does everybody in your society enjoy these goods, these benefits, the goals, do they? And do you do a voluntary local review, which is built into the, the, the process, and you find out, well, yeah, not so good. In the United States, the best state is Vermont, and it runs at 60%. Mississippi is down there at 32%. Not too good. And that's the United States, which has the wealth to actually manifest this for everybody. Okay, but the key thing for me is television. We put the message out 
to the mass audience. How many people will watch that? Well, you might be surprised. But say in a major station, how about in, in Chicago or uh, Los Angeles? I think you get an audience of a solid 50,000, maybe 100,000 people will watch one television program. That's right. And nothing we've done gets anything like that kind of viewership. And this is about not reforming the UN and weighted voting and uh, global governance. No, it's not about none of that. It's about, do, does it, is everybody getting educated? Does everybody have sufficiency? Is there uh, social justice institutions in our community? And the answer is probably no, or not good enough. And then we can, and the whole point is to get local group to get at that. All the different groups to work together to manifest that in their communities. Okay, so that's what, I, what I'm working on. And this group would, could be very helpful uh, to, to work with me, us, uh, as we put these different uh, collaborating organizations and funding organizations together in order to uh, execute this project uh, around the country. And of course, there's nothing problem with doing around the world. Canada's a nice place to do it. You got Toronto, you know, and, and uh, uh, Vancouver and the whole gang, uh, uh, Montreal. So it's the same thing. And it doesn't have to be done even at that big level. It can be done on the campus level. On any, uh, I'm, uh, Rebecca, I'm thrilled that there's finally a, a, a world citizen a club at the George Washington University. I see that in your stuff. That is, yeah, that's it. And I, I, let me just, Go past that. So the one other thing I feel the strongest thing we need is precisely students. That's who will really change everything. And we can do this. What we need is courses in this stuff for credit. That's the key part. Credit. If the students are getting credit to study global governance and to learn about all of the possibilities, ah, now we suddenly have a massive cadre of uh, young people who are engaged in something that's meaningful to them. Personally, they got to get those credits. And it could be very much about implementing the sustainable development goals on their campuses. Thank you, David. If you don't mind, that's it. Um, we're coming to time to wrap up. Rebecca has a hand up, I, I guess, for one more comment. Um, thanks for that input. It's great. We'll reach out to you. Um, you. Rebecca. Thank you so much. Yes, I just want to quickly respond to that very quickly. Um, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals certainly are an enormously powerful rallying cry, of course, uh, and uh, device uh, for seismic global change, building off of the earlier Millennium Development Goals. Um, at the same time, the Sustainable Development Goals were launched in 2015 and last year and aimed to be completed by 2030. Uh, last year, 2023, there was a midpoint progress report that found that only 15% of the 169 SDGs had been met uh, or were on track, excuse me, to be achieved by 2030. Not had been met by last year, but were on track to be achieved by 2030. Um, it also showed that 48% uh, of targets are moderately or severely off track. 37% have se either seen no progress or have regressed below not 2015 le levels. And um, this one I just had to pull up because uh, I don't memorize everything. Um, some that are particularly off track are hunger, sustainable diets and health outcomes, ter terrestrial and marine biodiversity, urban pollution, housing, strong institutions and peaceful societies. And most affected by these are the global south and uh, by this dip disproportionate um, lack of progress um, are the global south and vulnerable populations. And in uh, some respect, I think Secretary General's um, call for this Pact for the Future, some of the future process was a last, I won't say last ditch attempt, but maybe last ditch attempt um, to take the SDG process and try to um, channel that momentum in a way that um, in, in so, into something new because in a recognition that this wasn't working. Um, because I completely agree with you that this is a process that needs to be embraced from the very grassroots, through the local, through the regional, um, all the way up to the global, as we do with everything at uh, world federalism. Um, but in the case of the SDGs, many of the targets explicitly require state buy-in and policy change. And uh, that is not forthcoming in many circumstances. Um, can this be rectified? I hope so. And I think maybe a key is um, latching on to strategic SDGs and strategic indicators 
Um, but I think that the, there is a sense at this point that the lack of progress actually um, could be a uh, lead to a diminution of confidence in the system um, and the credibility and legitimacy of setting goals and targets like this. Because you've mentioned the word implementation, which is absolutely critical, but as critical as implementation is accountability. And the lack of accountability in meeting the targets of the SDGs has been thus far, I think, a major impediment to uh, true progress and change. And I'm never the, the negative Nancy at the table, so I apologize for playing that role here, but would love to discuss this further with you. Fantastic, Rebecca. Um, Dan is informing that he has to leave soon, so I guess this is a good time to wrap up. Um, for our authors and speakers today, I would like to say huge thank you for your time. It has been a unusually vibrant discussion following um, our presentations, which were mixed and excellent. Um, Dan, do you have any words to close with? I know that you've got a run, no, hand waved. Um, Drea is reminding me that our next book club is on July 13th with uh, Dr. Emma Onsong. Um, you can find her a link to her book in the chat. Um, yeah, Rebecca? Yes. Will you um, maybe say a word in closing about how to contribute to Mondial? Yes, of course. Um, so if you'd like to, uh, we're currently open um, for the summer edition. Um, Canada is closed, I believe. It's a call for, for, for articles. Um, we are looking to close ours soon. But if you have ideas for articles now and you're able to put something together very fast, you could reach out to us. Otherwise, we'll, of course, be open for the next edition in the winter and we'll be opening for calls in the autumn. Um, if you'd like to reach out to us, you can write to any of us here. You have all of our emails. Um, so that would be terrific. Uh, yep. Drea has put the, the link, the, the, um, email, uh, in the chat outreach at global solutions for Mondial articles. Um, any more thoughts from the floor or shall we close? Rebecca, I see you. I'm just trying to get the link to the contributors handbook, which I just did. So I put that in the chat. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, we'll leave the chat up for a moment. So just a final thanks to everyone for your time. Great session today. Looking forward to seeing you in July. Um, uh, the information about that session, as I said, is, is on Global Solutions website. Um, thanks a lot. Thanks to all of our speakers. <laughs>